All right, so chapters three and four deal with how compounds are formed. And so chapter three is predominantly dealing with ionic compounds and ionic bonding. And chapter four is dealing more with covalent bonding. But we'll see that they're not really that different from one another. And so one involves actually donating or accepting electrons, the ionic bonding, and covalent bonding is going to involve sharing electrons between two elements. So some of the goals for chapter three is to provide a definition for an ion. So at the end, you should be able to describe ions and ionic bonds and give the general properties of compounds that contain ionic bonds. You should be able to identify the octet rule and how it applies to ions and how ions are determined by using the octet rule. You should also understand the relationship between elements positioned in the periodic table and the formation of the ion. So being able to use the periodic table to predict the likely ions that are formed by atoms of a given element. You should also be familiar with how to formulate an ionic compound and write the correct chemical formula. And then you should be familiar with the naming of ionic compounds. And we'll get a brief introduction in this chapter as well to acids and bases. So you should be able to recognize common acids and bases by the end of the chapter as well. So there's two major types of bonds that we're going to talk about to make all of the different types of compounds. The first one is the ionic type of bond. And this involves an electrostatic attraction between two different ions. So what this means is that electrons have to be donated from one atom to another atom. And this causes charged particles to occur. And they stay together because they're oppositely charged and they're attracted to each other. So the negative charge is going to be attracted to the positive charge. And this electrostatic attraction between the two ions that's formed is what keeps that bond together. The covalent bonds involve sharing of the electrons rather than donating or accepting electrons. So only the valence shell electrons are going to be involved in chemical bonding. So remember, the valence shell electrons are from the s or the p orbitals in the outer shell of the atom. And so these electrons then are the readily movable parts. The interior electrons cannot be used for bonding. We'll see a few exceptions to this rule in the transition metals, but in general, the electrons in the valence shell are the only movable parts on the atom. So when we were defining the valence shell, we said that it involves the s and the p orbitals in the highest shell that is available for an atom. And so the maximum number of electrons that can be housed within that outer shell is a total of eight electrons. And so we call this an octet for eight. And this gives rise to the octet rule. So elements that become involved in chemical bonds are the most stable if they can obtain the noble gas arrangement of electrons. That means that they have a full s and p orbital or a full valence shell of electrons. So for main family elements, those in our s block or our p block, the periodic table can be used to predict how many electrons need to be gained or lost to obtain the noble gas state for each element. And we touched on this at the end of chapter two. So we said our main group elements, our s block elements here, these guys, group one would give a positive one charge because it's gonna lose that one electron. Group two are gonna lose two electrons. Group three are going to lose three electrons to get back to the noble gas state. Group four usually is involved in sharing of the electrons because it's right in the middle. It's got four valence electrons. It needs to get four more to get to the octet rule. And then here we've got five electrons in the valence shell, so it needs three more electrons to get to the octet rule. So it generally is going to gain three electrons. The group six is going, it has six valence electrons and it's going to gain two more to get to the octet rule. And group seven has seven valence shell electrons and it needs to gain one electron. So these characteristics can be utilized to predict 
what types of ions are going to be formed by the elements in the main group S and P blocks. So ions are formed by either gaining or losing one or more electrons. So an atom can be converted into this charged particle, and this charged particle is called an ion. The symbol for an ion is written by adding the electrical charge as a superscript to the symbol for that element. So if we have a sodium ion, sodium is in the group one elements, the alkali metals, and so it's going to lose one electron. If it loses an electron, it's losing a negative charge, and so the protons are now more abundant than the electrons. So there's one extra proton than there are electrons when this ion forms. And so the sodium would get a plus one charge. If the number of the charge is one, we drop the one and we only show a plus or a minus. If it's more than just one, then we'll indicate the number at the top. So if it was plus two, we'd have to indicate plus two. If it was minus two or minus three, we'd have to indicate that as well. So when the elements become ions, this is when they can be involved in ionic bonding. So the loss of one or more electrons from a neutral atom gives a positively charged ion, and if the ion is positively charged, it's called a cation. So sodium and other alkali metals have a single electron in their valence shell. So if we were looking at the electron configuration for sodium, the first shell, the N1, level is going to be 1s2, so two electrons are housed here. The second shell has a 2s2 and 2p6. This is completely filled. And then the third shell has one electron in the s orbitals. So there's one electron out here. So it can get to a noble gas configuration or a full octet if it loses that one electron. So if it loses that one electron, its electron configuration is going to mimic neon. That is the noble gas that precedes sodium on the periodic table, and this is the noble gas in row two, or period two of the periodic table. The electron configuration is now like the noble gas neon, but the proton configuration remains unchanged. There are no protons that get lost from the sodium atom. So the cation contains 11 protons, and now it contains 10 electrons. So since these are positively charged, this is going to get a plus one charge when it forms its ionic state. So ions have very different properties than the ground state of any element. So when sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons, it's a very reactive metal. And this is the one that's highly reactive then with water. If you threw this form of sodium into water, it would cause an explosion because it would react very quickly with the water molecules to actually lose an electron. And when this electron jumps off, it's going to release lots of energy. So when it does this, it's going to cause that vigorous reaction and it's going to cause the explosion when it reacts with the water. However, the ionic form of sodium, once it's become like this, is much less reactive. And it can form ionic compounds like sodium chloride or table salt that we would sprinkle on our french fries and eat. So you could eat the ionic form of sodium, but you could not eat the elemental form of sodium. It would cause a very awful, dramatic reaction. So this again is known as a cation because it is becoming positive in nature when it forms its ion. You can also have ions that will gain one or more electrons and if they're gaining electrons they're gaining negative charge and so if the overall atom is negatively charged the ion is called an anion. So you have cations and anions. So chlorine and the other halogens that have seven valence electrons want to gain an additional electron so that they can reach their octet rule or their full octet. So this would be the electron configuration of chlorine. The first shell is full, the second shell is full, and the third shell is almost full in its valence shell. There's seven out of the eight. So this p orbital can house one more electron. When it gains this electron, it's going to have a full octet.
So sodium atoms like to interact with the chlorine atoms. The sodium atom is going to give up the electron and the chlorine atom is going to gain it. And so they would form charged particles so that they could form a bond. So these are just some examples of common cations. You've got potassium and calcium will lose two because it's in the alkaline earth metal category or group two. Aluminum would lose three electrons because it's in the main group three group. And then we have a new type of, of compound here that's called ammonia. And this is called a polyatomic ion. And so polyatomic means many atoms. And so there's multiple atoms that are involved in the formation of this ion. And in fact, the, the nitrogen that's bound with four hydrogens here is actually bound using covalent bonding. And so we haven't talked a lot about covalent bonding yet, but this is where the atoms are actually sharing electrons. And then there's one extra proton that's going to be associated with this to give this a positive charge. So we'll see how these polyatomic ions are formed once we get to the covalent bonding section and we learn a little bit more about electron sharing. But when you see these covalent, when you see these polyatomic ions, you can use them like you would use a single ion. They move together. So the NH4 is always going to stay together and it's always going to have a plus one charge. So anytime that you're moving it to bond or interact with an anion, you're going to move it as an entire group. It's going to stay together. So we also can have anions, which are negatively charged ions. And these would be good examples of anions. So things like fluorine, chlorine, oxygen would gain two electrons to have a negative two charge. And then you can also have polyatomic anions as well. And so the nitrate anion, NO3, it's got, it has one nitrogen three oxygens and these are held together as well by covalent bonds and they have one extra electron associated with this to give this an overall negative charge. So again the polyatomic ions are going to move around together as one unit. So you always have to move these around as a unit and it's always going to have a negative one charge to it. So I think we'll stop there for this section and next time we'll talk about electronegativity and the forces that cause compounds to either share electrons or donate or accept them. So whether they're going to become covalent interactions or whether they're going to become ionic interactions.